What is up, ladies and gentlemen? Welcome to this week's episode of The Formula, where we break down and explore the elements of achievement in world class performers. I'm your host, Trevor Carlson. Now, when I say we break down and explore the elements of achievement, I mean that I interview awesome people from around the world and have discussions with them around their whatever's led into their professional or personal success and try to break it down in a way so that you can take something away from it or learn from it and apply it to your own life and hopefully help you to get closer to some of your own goals or to get something that uh, you know you want out of life that you know you're just missing that little piece of information that could help you get there. This week's guest is Girls Gone Strong's Jen Comas. Jen shares her personal story about how she got into fitness. And, you know, I, I actually stumbled on her stuff uh, on her Instagram. And she was doing all kinds of crazy exercises like acro yoga, uh, climbing uh, ropes up to the ceiling. Uh, she had a, a workout routine that one of my friends did. And Actually, they recommended I check out her stuff. So big shout out to Jamie Wilson to recommending Jen Comas's uh, Instagram profile for me. So we also talk about where does she begin with someone that is new to joining her fitness group? What are the most common obstacles that people that train with her or work with her have to overcome? And how does she help them to overcome those obstacles? This was a really interesting conversation for me personally because, you know, physical fitness and exercise is something that the older I get, it seems like the more and more I get into and the more and more fun I have with it. So I really enjoyed this interview with Jen. She, she shares a lot of her personal insights and things that she's learned along her journey. And I, I really hope that uh, you can take something away and maybe it'll encourage you to, uh, to, you know, take a different path in your physical fitness uh, journey or uh, exploration. So Let's get this interview started with Girls Gone Strong's Jen Comis. Uh, today's guest on the Formula Podcast is Girls Gone Strong founder Jen Comis. Jen, thanks for uh, taking the time to show up on the podcast today and uh, and share some of your you know your story and some uh, fitness tips with us. Yeah, absolutely. Thanks for having me. So how did how did you really get started in the in the fitness world and, and with, uh, with, with girls gone strong. Cause that's a pretty vibrant, uh, online community over on, on Facebook, right? Yeah. Yeah. We have a really great audience and community that we've worked really, really hard to build with girls gone strong. And, uh, the way I got into fitness is actually a pretty interesting and funny story. Um, I was very lazy growing up teenager. I was a book, hardcore bookworm all about reading and writing. Uh, and because of that, I put my physical fitness and my health just completely on the back burner. Uh, I went on into high school and ended up failing high school gym class, not once, but twice because I hated any type of physical activity. I just, I found it to be completely abhorrent. Uh, so I kind of went on early, uh, or excuse me. Yeah. Like 16, 17 years old. And I kind of had this big aha moment when I was like, I'm not taking care of myself. I've got to pull it together. So I joined a gym and the lowest hanging fruit for me at the time, because I had no idea what I was doing was group fitness classes. So I was taking like step aerobics and then I started taking spin classes and kind of got into it that way. From there, that ended up evolving. I kind of actually fell in love with the group fitness program. I loved the camaraderie and the community. Uh, so I went on to start teaching group fitness classes and then that evolved to personal training from their competing in figure from their power lifting. It was like kind of the next thing after the next. And then it was kind of in the middle of my power lifting journey is when, uh, myself and six other women founded girls gone strong. How did that, how did that kind of take place Were you guys or well, you gals, were you, were you just like, we, we need to create a community for people that have the same goals as us to kind of come together and maybe share different fitness ideas or walk, walk me through what that process was like. Yeah, well, this was back in, I want to say, uh, 2011, when Girls Gone Strong came to be a thing. And that was when CrossFit was kind of just starting to really pick up some traction. And 
lifting really heavy weights and well, women lifting really heavy weights just kind of wasn't as common as it is now. Uh, and it was myself, Molly Galbraith, five other amazing women. We had actually, I knew Molly in real life. We were friends in real life, but Uh, we had become, all seven of us had become friends on social media. We were talking via Twitter and we became Facebook friends because we all had that kind of common thread, which was lifting heavy weights and wanting to bring the message to women that, hey, it's okay to lift weights if that's what you want to do. So we ended up uh, all kind of coordinating this meetup to go support Julia Laduski, who's an amazing strength and conditioning coach and powerlifter. Uh, She was competing in a powerlifting meet in Tennessee, Cincinnati. And uh, so we all met up there and it was so wild. We were all just in the gym and talking and we were like, there is just not an online space for women that want to like lift weights and they don't want any of the fitness fluff. And so like that weekend is when it just kind of came to be. We were like, it was like this light bulb went off and we all went, we've got to do this thing. So what, what's that experience been like since you started the community? Because you, you have a few hundred thousand members right now, right? And it's, it seems like it's a pretty, pretty, I mean, from what I can tell, I, I wasn't on there a lot, um, but I did notice that it seemed like there's a lot of engagement and a lot of stuff going on. Yeah, absolutely. The community is such an important component to us. Like everything that we do is all about our community. And on Facebook, it's like there's over 200,000 people that follow the Facebook page. But then also we have several free Facebook groups that we run. We have a coaching and training women group that's just geared towards coaches and trainers. We have a, a group called Soul You, which is strong women lift each other up. That's open to anyone that identifies as a woman. Um, and that's like, I think we just crossed the 20,000 mark with that. Um, and then we also have another group for moms, moms that are trying to, you know, communicate with each other and stay healthy. And so really nurturing those communities and letting ladies have a chance to talk and be heard and be responded to, like that is such an important part of what we do. We want everyone to feel like they're being heard. Yeah, I think that's that's really important, especially I feel like fitness is so, somewhat of a sensitive topic to some people when, they, when it's not their, uh, their forte, I guess. Because I think back to... Um, I hired a personal trainer a little over a year ago, and I remember like the first day I went in to work out with him, I was very, very uh, intimidated and very like, I have no idea what I'm doing. I've been like a skinny, nerdy dude most of my life, uh, invested mostly most of my time into like uh, learning and tech stuff. So going to do that was like, oh man, this is completely out of my comfort zone. So I think it's really important that you know, there's like that uh, welcoming environment so people feel comfortable sharing, um, which kind of brings me to a, a question that I had. Um, you know, if so, let's say somebody joins one of your groups or signs up for one of your programs, where's the where's the first place that you start with them? Uh, The first place that we typically start is we offer them an invitation to join one of our free Facebook groups. Because like I said, those are communities. Uh, I feel like we have a community for kind of anyone, whether you're a coach coach or trainer, uh, whether you're, you know, someone that identifies as a woman and you want a place to like talk about your nutrition and your training or whatever the case may be. So we invite them into one of our Facebook groups or all if all apply. And then that way they can start kind of talking and getting involved in the conversation. Yeah. And once, so they're, they're in the conversation, they're kind of, uh, talking through some, some of the different, um, fitness, their fitness goals or, or whatever's next. Um, they're in the group. Then, then what happens with them? Is it, I guess I'm wondering, is it something where you're like, okay, do you recommend going like once a week and, you know, just hopping on the treadmill for just try try to get in the routine of going, or is it something like, all right, this is boot camp day one. You're going to go for two hours. I guess I'm wondering what that process looks like. Oh, okay. So yeah, so we, we do have a coaching program. So our Facebook groups aren't uh, necessarily coaching groups. They're just there to let the ladies um, talk and be heard and kind of communicate with them and also with each other. And um, then we also have a coaching program, which is Strongest You Coaching. And that's the program that I head up. Uh, but in general, what we never tell people what to do. Uh, instead, we ask people a whole lot of questions. And then we try to help them come to the conclusion 
conclusion of what's going to feel best for them. We do not at all agree with the whole, like, this is, you know, here's what you're going to do. And this is what it's going to look like. Instead, we start to ask questions to help them come to their own conclusion. Can you give me an example of any, any of the questions that you typically ask people? Yeah. So oftentimes, um, a really common question that we'll get is kind of one that you had just asked, like, how often should I be exercising? What's the, you know, the right amount of time. And so we'll ask them questions like, well, how much time do you have per week to really commit to exercise? How much time per week do you feel confident that you're going to be able to meet that goal? Which type of exercise appeals to you most? And so we start to kind of ask those questions to get those wheels turning because we want to have them be able to start with something that they feel 100% confident that they're going to be able to do. And if I have a, a woman that tells me I can commit to a 30 minute spin class once a week, then that's where we're going to have her start because I can give her some, you know, training program that I feel is going to be this great thing. But if she can't follow it and she's not going to follow, it doesn't matter what I give her, you know, so asking questions, having them kind of figure out, okay, this is where I can start and where I feel confident. Then we kind of build on it from there. Is there a, is there a starting place where, where you feel like is, is better than others when it, in regards to, uh, I, I, you, I know you ask the questions and you kind of like build a, a workout regimen that fits their schedule. Is there like a, I guess what I'm trying to say is a way or an approach that you found is more successful or maybe, um, a certain, I guess I'm looking at more of like the habit building of of the exercising process. Uh, what have you found to work uh, versus like what haven't, what hasn't worked as well? In terms of like building healthy habits? Yeah, just with uh, exercise and I guess diet and exercise. I'm assuming the habit building goes uh, along with both of those. So yeah, we, we ask them, um, like I said, we ask them a whole lot of questions, find out what they're willing to do. And then from there, we kind of start to build on it. We do have a certain, like we have certain things that we recommend for most people. Like we recommend that most people are resistance training at least twice a week. We recommend that most people are doing, you know, 20 to 25 minutes of moderate intensity cardio twice a week. So like we do have some, uh, parameters that we like to use, but we, we, work up to those differently depending on where the client currently is in her in her process. Yeah, that that makes makes sense from a uh, building it around their specific profile. And I'm I'm assuming that when you have a lot of these conversations, there's a lot of similar things that come up or obstacles that come up when people are working on getting started. What are the most common I guess, roadblocks or, or um, hurdles that your clients have to overcome? And how do you work them through those? Yeah, you, it, you know, working with women is really interesting. I feel like we often tend to, and, and this may happen with men too. I just, my experience is obviously with women, but we tend to really overthink things. We want to get things just right. It's got to be perfect. If it's not perfect, it doesn't count. And oftentimes women also think that more is going to be more and, and it usually isn't. And so with exercise, they feel like if they can't go in and just do it all exactly how it's mapped out, then it doesn't count. Like that is probably that like all or nothing mindset is the most common thing that I see in the women that I work with. They just feel like they can't, absolutely crush it with their, their nutrition, their workouts, their healthy lifestyle, meaning like sleep and stress control, then like, what's the point? Like the whole week's like blown to smithereens and we're going to start again next Monday. So that is one of the biggest, uh, struggles and that we have to help them kind of work through. Um, it does take a lot of shifting when it comes to mindset and helping them understand that, Hey, if you can't get in a 60 minute workout, can you get in a 20 minute workout because it still counts, right? 20 minutes is better than nothing. That's kind of where we, we really, really chip away at that and help them understand that everything that they do contributes to their bottom line. It doesn't have to be like perfect or it just doesn't count at all. So. Yeah, that, that, that's something that I struggle with too. Cause it's, it's like, oh man, I'm, I'm running late. I had an hour to go to the gym and now I only have a half hour. Do I even want to go at all? Is it worth it? And I guess from what you're saying is like, yes, go to the gym still. <laughs> Don't skip. Absolutely. Yes, absolutely. All right. So what? that's the number one 
obstacle or roadblock that you deal with. Is there a second one that comes up a lot? Uh, the second one that comes up the most for sure for us working with women are the societal pressures that are placed on women in terms of how we're supposed to look, how our bodies are supposed to look, how we're supposed to act, um, especially w- with like the media magazines always pushing like, you know, the tighter tummy in 10 days and get rid of unsightly cellulite and all this stuff. Like those messages are messages that so many women and myself included have internalized through the last, well, since we were (laughs) very, very young. So trying to dismantle those things and start to realize like you actually are completely worthy exactly how you are, like cellulite, not a flat stomach, like whatever, like that stuff actually doesn't matter, <laughs> you know, and, and it does to some people, like I, I understand it matters to some women, but in the grand scheme of things, like these are not going to be the things that we remember on our deathbed. So I think, uh, breaking down like those societal messages that we're constantly receiving, that's an easy number two for <laughs> challenges. Yeah. That's reminds me, uh, my friend is going to hate me for bringing this up, but, uh, he, he did some modeling for, I don't know, some big department store. I can't remember which one. And he was going to the same personal trainer and he was like, he's like, I feel really bad saying this, but I'm going and I'm modeling and all these guys are like in such, he, he's in like really good shape though too. So I'm like, sh- sh- I'm like, shut up. Like you're, you're in way better shape than everyone else here. And he's like, you know, I'm really self-conscious because all these guys are in better shape than I am. So I think it kind of goes, depending on your environment, it might go both ways a little bit. And it's, uh, you know, it's, the whole the whole point about kind of accepting that some of these things you can't control all the time, I think it's a really important lesson. I was reading a a blog post that somebody had written. I think they'd been diagnosed with some type of um, uh, I'm trying to think of the right words, an, an illness that you know that you're eventually going to pass away from. Um, I'm drawing a blank on it right now. But they wrote this post and they were like, you know, this is probably my last Christmas and here's what the message I would like to share with everyone. And they're talking about like, you know, like you said, are these the thing? these are the things that you're not going to remember when you're basically on your deathbed. And it's like, how, like, do I have an extra, you know, do I have an extra inch around my waist? Um, how do I look today? Those types of things. But yeah, I just, I just found that really fascinating because it, it kind of made me do a double check or like check myself a little bit. Like what else am I? what else could I possibly be valuing too much more than the things that are really important? So when somebody brings up these, these issues to you or issues, <laughs> these, these obstacles to you, like this one specifically with uh, image and uh, appearance, how do you work with them to, to overcome that uh, obstacle? Yeah, it, it takes, it does take a lot of work, but there are a couple of action steps that I really love for people um, to try and see if that makes an impact. One of the biggest things is help, helping them perch their social media or encouraging them to perch their social media. So for example, for a long time, when I was trying to get out of this dieting mindset and all my self-worth was based on how my body looked, I was following all of these figure and bikini competitors on Instagram and all these like diet and, you know, following different macronutrient accounts and all this stuff. And that stuff, um, I had kind of hidden it under the guise of inspiration and it, it wasn't, it wasn't inspiring me. It was cause I was allowing it to make me feel like I wasn't worthy. And I was allowing those messages to kind of get inside my head and make me feel like I'm supposed to look like this. So we encourage our ladies to go through their social media and purge anything that isn't making them feel better when they see it. So, cause some people are like, Oh, I don't know. Like it feels like it's inspiring. So kind of the litmus test for that is when I see this accounts post, do I feel lifted up and lighter or do I feel kind of bogged down and like, I'm not good enough. And that answer is usually really fast and quick. Uh, so purging social media is one that we like to encourage people to do. And then also in the realm of social media as well, we encourage women to follow accounts of a wide variety of bodies and skin colors and age and 
accounts that show that there's actually more to life than just how your body looks. And of course, this is not a slight to like anyone that's a figure competitor, bikini competitor. That stuff's great for some people. But if you are deep in this uh, mindset kind of matrix trying to get it figured out, it may not be the best thing. So we encourage them to purge their social media, follow accounts that show different, a lot of diversity when it comes to body, skin color, age. Um, and something else that I really like to see women do is go through their closet and get rid of any clothing that they might be holding on to that used to fit them. And now it's kind of bringing them down every time they open their closet. So kind of just get it going through everything, purging, clearing the clutter, getting rid of the things that don't serve them so that they can focus on where they're at right now. Yeah. I, I love everything you're saying right now because it, it reminds me of uh, just lessons that I've learned in other aspects of life too. Like the, like with social media, I think everybody should do that. I, I, when I discovered the unfollow button or <laughs> what, or whatnot on Facebook, that was like the best day. Cause now my social experience is fairly enjoyable, but I do, I still do struggle with, you know, this balance between should I be up posting a bunch on social? Should I be spending a bunch of time there? Which part of me from like a podcast or business owner standpoint feels like I should be doing, but then I also don't want to do it because <laughs> I'm like, I want to be doing other, th I want to go outside. I want to go to the gym. I want to go do some acro yoga or, or uh swing or salsa dancing or whatever. I don't really want to be posting all the time. So it's a, it's an interesting balance from that perspective as well. And uh, have you, are you familiar with the concept, um, hell yes or no? Um, no, but I mean, I, I can kind of guess. Like if it's not a hell yes, it's a no. Yeah, Is it that thing? yeah absolutely. Okay. Yeah, so when you're talking about the, like the social and, um, and the clothes, um, I mean, it's, it's a concept I picked up not that long ago. And it actually makes things a lot better because it's like, is this opportunity a hell yes? Like, are you excited about it? Then it's just automatically a no. Yeah. And same thing with like clothing. I read, um, God, what was that book? Um, the life changing magic of tidying up by Marie Kondo. And it's like the same concept. Like it's with your clothes. Is it bringing you joy? Is it a hell yes? I want to keep this piece of clothing. Um, if not, then, you know, it, it goes. So I think those are all it's interesting how it all applies in all these different fields. Absolutely. Okay. So, so social media is purged, uh, closets purged. What's next? Uh, next thing is I like to encourage women to ask themselves, when are they not thinking about their bodies? So assuming that body image is the issue, like what are you doing or when are you not thinking about it? So like, for example, me, like if I'm out hiking, if I'm on like my dirt bike, like those are times I'm not thinking at all about how my body looks. So we encourage them to tune into those times. Notice what they're doing when they're not, when they're thinking, when they're feeling really good, when they're not thinking about their body and then try to uh, cultivate more of those types of times, you know? So if, if they find that going to the gym all the time is really stressing them out because they feel super self-conscious, can you get a workout in some other way that isn't bringing up those negative feelings, like going for the hike or the bike ride or the swim? Yeah. Would, would you say that it's, I mean, when I'm listening, I hear things that probably make them happier or make people happier in general, like focusing on those activities that maybe combine both fitness and fun or joy or, or whatever term you want to use. So it's, it's a, it's not really a one size fits all. And it almost sounds like there might be some type of like flow presence or maybe a level of like being more present in, in whatever you're doing, uh, kind of to de decrease your, uh, awareness of your own image, right. Or self image. Absolutely. It, and it's, it can be tricky too, because we know that you can go out and you can hike or bike ride or, you know, do all these things that will still get you moving and you'll still reap the benefits. And I dare say more than you would in the gym because you're feeling good about it. But a lot of women still feel like if they're not going to the gym, it doesn't count, you know, so you kind of have to like sneak that in there <laughs> for yeah. them to get them to transition over. I think men, I think guys think about that though, too, because even as I'm thinking through it right now, I've been doing a, a different workout program. Um, just most of it's been at home and it's been, I feel like it's been effective, but I also feel like I'm like 
cheating a little bit because I'm not going to the gym every day. And I'm like, I'm like working out for like an hour, hour and a half, but I'm not going to the gym. So I feel, I don't know. It's, it's a fun workout, but I feel less like I'm actually doing anything, <laughs> you know? <laughs> I totally understand. I took a month last summer and I said, okay, I'm not going to go to the gym this month at all. I'm only going to like do like outside outside workout. So I was hiking and like carrying boulders up a hill and like throwing boulders over my head and stuff. And I totally understand. Like I loved it. It was really fun, but it is a different feeling if you're used to being in that gym environment. It's very much a, it's a different mindset. <laughs> yeah. It, I mean, I did some rock climbing this summer and you know, it was an insanely difficult like workout for my forearms, but I was still like, Oh, I still need to go to the gym. I'm like, no, I just spent four out five hours on like a rock face. Why, why do I need to go? I'm like, I, I don't know. It's, it's an interesting, um, mental hurdle to get past that fitness can be fun and effective at the same time. It doesn't just have to be like a grind. Yeah. So true. So is there anything else that you would, you would have them work through? So uh, socials purged, closets purged. Uh, you're kind of helping them do more fun stuff, for lack of a better term, um, with their with their fitness and and having them do activities that bring them more present and less. They're not as conscious of their um, self image. Is there anything else you'd add to that? Yeah. The, the last thing that I would add is we focus on helping them change their language. So we know that changing the way that we think is really, really difficult. It takes a lot of practice, a lot of consistency. Um, and sometimes it's just really, it's just plain hard, but we do have more control over the words that we actually speak out loud. So we encourage them that if you're, even if you're thinking tough thoughts about your body or negative things, watch the language that you're speaking because what we say out loud definitely kind of ingrains those thoughts. So if we can at least prevent ourselves from speaking negatively out loud, that's kind of the first step to helping to at least neutralize our thoughts. Like we're not necessarily going for positive. That usually feels like too big of a stretch for a lot of people, but if we can just neutralize, then that's usually a little bit more accessible. Yeah. Do you have, do you have any examples of what would be considered negative, uh, self-talk? Yeah. So, I mean, it, it, you know, for me personally, I would get up in the morning and I'd be like, Oh my gosh, like you're so fat, like, <laughs> horrible. you know, and then like to neutralize that you could wake up in the morning and be like, Oh, well, you know, today is Wednesday and it's 1136 AM. And this is what my body looks like today. Like that's, <laughs> that's an example of just neutralizing. Like it is what it is and it's not good and it's not bad. It's just, it is what it is. Yeah. How do you, how do you work with someone to get them from, you know, uh, I, I don't look as well as I should today or how I feel like I should today to neutralizing that, that negative self-talk. Yeah. Oftentimes a lot of people, like when, when they say something negative out loud, I find that simply getting them to talk through it a little bit is really helpful. Um, uh, my good friend and just amazing, everything kind of coach Erin Brown, her approach with this is if someone says something negative, she says to them, it sounds like you're being really hard on yourself today. Do you want to talk about it? And that kind of just opens the door to let them just kind of free flow. Like they can just talk about whatever they want and then asking questions like, you know, what do you think may have brought this on? What do you think might be causing this? And just asking questions, letting them talk through it, and then leaning, helping them lean into neutralizing any type of negative thing that they're saying. Um, and again, this stuff takes a lot of practice and a lot of time. It's definitely not, not like one conversation and we can switch it, but maybe opening their mind to the idea of starting to neutralize the, these negative thoughts and just listening, letting them talk through it can oftentimes be all they need. They're like, oh my gosh, I feel so much better. And I didn't even say anything. I just asked questions. <laughs> Yeah. Sometimes people just need space, you know, to, to let everything out. Yeah. The, the whole negative self-talk thing is a, it's a, it can, I imagine it's fairly challenging. Is there a specific, um, I guess I'm trying to think of the right, the right term I'm looking for. Is there a most common negative self-talk piece or statement that you hear most? Yeah, it's usually that women feel like they don't look like they feel like they're supposed to look. 
They think, you know, they're, they're worried about what people think of them. They think people are judging them based on their appearance. It, it really ultimately boils down to the fact that they don't think their body looks the way society wants it to look. Yeah. And how do you, how do you work with uh, someone who, who brings that to your attention as you're working with them? Um, we, what we typically do is kind of, first of all, we, we ask them a lot of questions. We try to get them to talk about it. Like, where did this come from? When are you experiencing this the most often? When are you not feeling this? You know, and then we get them to work through the steps that we had mentioned earlier about purging social media, you know, seeing if they can try to stop, uh, using negative language out loud and at least like neutralize it if they do choose to talk about themselves at all. Um, so it's kind of, it's a lot and it takes a little while, lots of practice, but most of all it's talking through it and then actively making some changes to help them, uh, kind of better curate their inputs that they're taking in via social media and magazines and TV. (laughs) Yeah. I think people should just do that in general though. (laughs) It's probably not good for your mental health to absorb all that stuff all the time. Right. I feel like there was some gym recently that said that they were banning all news or something because it was like bad for your mental health. I don't know. I saw it pop up somewhere. I thought that was an interesting concept. Yeah. Okay. So let's, uh, let's talk a little bit about, uh, dumbbell domination. Cause that was how, uh, I was, I was introduced to the stuff that you're doing on Instagram. I, well, I want to talk about dumbbell domination, but I think we might have enough time to cover some of the more fun stuff that, I've seen from some of your posts, which is like acro yoga and stuff yeah. like that. Because I'm a I'm a low level uh, practitioner of acro, but <laughs> there's so many great like life lessons that I've learned just from that. Like, how much do you actually trust your your partner? <laughs> For one, uh, do you how much do you trust strangers <laughs> right. to like prevent you from falling on your face? So, uh, is there would you prefer to talk about? Uh, the dumbbell domination course or, uh, or acro right now we can talk about both, but, uh, is there, yeah, let's, let's talk about dumbbell domination. All right. Tell me about dumbbell domination. Yeah. So this is a program that I created and launched in fall of 2017. Um, it was inspired by the books, the choose your own adventure books, which were my favorite books when I was younger. And, if anyone knows me, they totally understand why, because I am constantly seeking out adventure. I don't like to be told what to do at all. <laughs> I don't think anyone does, but I think that I, I especially despise it. <laughs> um, but they were inspired by the Choose Your Own Adventure books. Um, so if anyone's listening and does not know what that is or what those were, it basically takes you through this story and then you come to like, you may come to a certain fork in the road and it's like, oh, if you go right, it's going to take your character into the city. And if you go left, you can go to like the farm, <laughs> you know, and it's, it's a totally different adventure, whatever you decide to choose. So, um, all about autonomy, which I'm super into. So dumbbell domination is a do it yourself program. It's an ebook, um, that, is only based around dumbbells. I loved this concept because lots of the women that I work with are stay at home moms. So they have dumbbells at home. They can't leave their kids. Maybe they're entrepreneurs. They travel a lot. Most hotel gyms are sure to have dumbbells. If nothing else, they'll have a treadmill and some dumbbells. Uh, so just really accessible. I wanted to create something accessible really, really fast that, uh, also used weights and still gave you kind of the option to choose. So every workout, gives you the choice kind of of what you're going to do. And I'm, I'm, I love it. (laughs) So fun. Yeah. My friend Jamie was the one that, uh, we talked about this earlier, but Jamie Wilson was the one that, uh, took your dumbbell domination course. I feel, I feel like if this was the right moment in time, uh, she definitely looked, um, she, she looked like she'd been hitting the weights pretty hard. So she, she was (laughs) like, yeah, it's dumbbell domination. (laughs) <laughs> so, so, uh, I got to give you props for that. She was, she was really pumped too. So I'm sure that she, she'd be happy to, uh, tell you how much she enjoyed it as well. So what do you, what do you think was, you know, what do you, what do you think the difference between like your workout program using your choose your own adventure, uh, model versus like a normal, normal program? Like what, what do you think the differences are? Like the differences in results have been, um, between the two? Well, I really wanted to develop something that 
enables consistency because it mm-hmm. kind of goes back to what we were saying. If someone, you can give someone the greatest program in the world, if they don't follow it, it doesn't matter. So I wanted to give something to people that wanted short, intense workouts that still use weights that could be done virtually anywhere. Um, and so I feel like just kind of getting that, getting all those pieces dialed in the short duration, the intensity, the aspect, the component of the weights. I think that that's kind of the sweet spot that is, has been super helpful for so many people. Yeah. It reminds me a little bit of the workouts that I've, um, gone through a little bit on a site called nerdfitness.com. Yeah. Are you familiar with that? (laughs) Yeah. Yeah. I, I love how they, um, they kind of have you pick like your, your character avatar or whatever. And you're like, are you a scout? Are you like, what do you want to be? And then they kind of tell you what types of workouts would be best for you to accomplish that. So it sounds like you use some of the similar, like choose your own adventure concepts in this workout as well. Yeah. Yeah. I think you kind of got to spice it up a little bit, keep it interesting. You know, some people like me really don't like to be told what to do. (laughs) And also like I've followed several training programs throughout, you know, my like lifetime and some of them are really great, but I think we've all been there when you wake up one morning and you've got like, you know, X, Y, Z on your program and you're like, Oh my gosh, I am not in the mood to do this. And sometimes you have to suck it up and do it right. If we want like a well-balanced, strong body, but other times we just don't want to do it. So I wanted to be able to really give people a chance to choose something different and also something that's really fun. And I love that you likened it to nerd fitness because I got a chance to spend some time with uh, Steve uh, Kim, the creator of nerd, nerd fitness in New York. And I just, I'm, I, I love him. Like I love what they're doing. So fun. Yeah. I, I picked up his book. Uh, I don't remember when it was. It probably came out like close to two years ago, something like that. I don't know. All these, everything's, all these years start to <laughs> run together <laughs> the older I get. Um, but, uh, I make myself sound like I'm 60 or something, man, I'm only 30. <laughs> um, but I think, yeah, I feel like it was about two years ago that book came out and I really enjoyed it just because he had a lot of, uh, he had a lot of stories in there just on people that had, you know, they're like, this is their day job, but at night, you know, they're like this, <laughs> they're this uh, nerd fitness uh, warrior and they, they used to only be able to deadlift this much and this is how much they deadlift now, as well as play Dungeons and Dragons, you know, <laughs> so it's cool stuff. Um, so what's, are you, are you doing another version of uh, dumbbell domination here this spring? I feel like that you, I might've seen something about that. You might have to refresh my memory a little bit. Yeah, definitely. So uh, we did a launch for it back in the fall, and it has been completely just off the market since then, getting ready to bring it out again. It's going to go just on a three-day flash sale, uh, and then from there, it's just going to be turned into an evergreen product. So that's basically like fitness industry speak, meaning it's going to be available all the time on my website. So flash sale for a couple of days, and then it'll be available at a higher price on my website anytime after that. Yeah, that's awesome. I'm excited to... uh... I'm excited to see see how it goes. I I love the choose your own adventure type of stuff. Like anything that gives you a reason to have like more fun or it's like gives it a little bit more uh, diff- uh makes it different or exciting or something. It doesn't have to be boring. So so I think that's yeah. re- really cool. Um now I I'd, I'd like to talk about acro yoga a little bit. It wasn't on my list of things to talk with you about, but as I'm thinking about it, I'm like we got we got to talk about acro cuz it's 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 an interesting if if somebody's never done it before they're going to be like what the hell are they doing like why is that person on that other person's legs i don't understand what the <laughs> what the fun is in that but it's like well you need to try it that's <laughs> so what, what got you into acro yoga well, I have been a diehard yogi for well over a decade. Um, usually a very traditionalist when it, like a traditionalist when it comes to yoga. Um, and honestly, acro had never, uh, it had never really interested me for the last like several years, but last, I think I, I want to say it was late last fall or over the winter. I saw this picture on Instagram of this woman, um, and her boyfriend in this like crazy, beautiful acro pose. And it caught my attention. And I was like, Oh my gosh, like, this is so beautiful. And I really love like, really pretty lines and stuff. Like that's kind of always been my thing that I look for. And anyway, it's just really beautiful pose. And so I grabbed my boyfriend and I was like, Hey, we got to try this. And so he was like, 
oh, well, let me change my clothes. And we were at home. And so he, <laughs> he just changed his clothes. And like, we were attempting this like acro, this crazy acro pose that we'd never even, I had, we had no idea how they got into it. So we were doing that in our living room and, and we ended up like getting it like two days later, but it was, <laughs> it was really fun. So I've kind of fallen in love with it. It's just, it's so fun and so funny. Do you remember which, which move it was? I can't remember. It's posted on my Instagram. I can't remember the name of it, but it's kind of like, I don't know. It's like a side reclining, like leg extension. Okay. <laughs> no, I'm, I'm following. I'm trying to, I'm like, what would that, I don't, I don't know all the, all the moves by any means, but I'm trying to think of what it would be. Um, yeah, it's what, what, what do you think, uh, other than it being fun and, uh, you know, and enjoyable, what, what do you think that, um, because I, I can definitely talk about this for quite a while, but I'm wondering what your like, what you've learned about yourself or just life lessons in general from becoming a practitioner of acro. Yeah. So I, I typically, I like to be in control. Like it's kind of a joke among my friends. Like I hate riding two up on a motorcycle. Like I have to be the one driving it. Like I can't, I can't ride two up. I, I, I just don't like being out of control. So acro has been a great practice for me about being not out of control, but trusting my partner. Like when they say like, Hey, I've got you then being able to like lean into that and be like, okay, like you have me, it's totally fine. So I think it's been a practice of courage. It's also been a great practice of just kind of, uh, relinquishing a little bit of that control and trusting that the other person like actually has me when they say that they do. Yeah. It's, it, it's such a weird experience. Like I remember the first time, um, trying to get set up with like bird, you know, you're like leaning into your partner, kind of testing, testing weight and everything. And you're like, are you sure you got it? You sure you're gonna like kick me up and it's gonna be fine? Like, yeah. <laughs> and it's it's weird because eventually you're just like, after you've done it a bunch of times, it can be a complete newbie uh, on base, and you're like, all right, kick me up, let's do it. Yeah. <laughs> and, and whereas you know when you start, you're like, oh man, what's gonna happen? It's it's almost like you know that if you fall after a while, you're just gonna be okay. You're gonna get back up, and then. Um, you just kind of start to develop that trust with that other person, you know, or just yeah. with other people in general. You're like, in all likelihood, the worst thing that'll happen is I will fall on the ground, maybe scrape my arm or something, and then I'll get back up and I'll I'll uh, do it again. So, yeah, it's it's a uh, for all your listeners out there, go Google or get on YouTube and find some like basic <laughs> acro pose and find the. <laughs> find somebody that you at least trust initially or maybe it's a good maybe it'd be a good test for like how much you trust your partner in a relationship do you trust do you trust them enough to uh to to do an acro pose with <laughs> um, yeah it's really fun i love it yeah it's a good time all right jen so that brings us to the uh last part of our interview it's typically just like some typical regular questions that we ask all of our guests to kind of figure out the uh you know, the formula <laughs> for, for how, how they, you know, go about their day, what, what success or what, what they do on a daily basis that leads them to success. Um, most important book they've read and any type of message that they'd like to leave the audience. So the first question, what do you try to do on a daily basis that you feel like really helps you uh, just crush your day? Yeah. The, the one thing that I insist on all the time, and, and I feel like it sounds like a little like cheesy just because I feel like so many people talk about it, but I think it's because it works. And that is having a really solid morning routine. It doesn't matter. I travel all the time, wherever I'm at, always, always a morning routine. For me, that looks like coffee, obviously, but also I typically pull like tarot cards in the morning just to kind of prompt some introspection. I always journal write down my tasks for the day, like a couple of things that have to be done. And so just that process really helps me get clear on what I want my day to look like and gives me kind of some direction. So morning routine, even if it's just five minutes, because I realize not everyone has like half hour or an hour or whatever, but just five minutes to develop some type of morning routine that you love. It will also make your mornings feel so much better because you look forward to it. Yeah. I have a quick question on your journaling process. Is that uh, what does that look like? Is it um, like gratitude journaling, stream of consciousness? Walk me through what that is. 
Yeah. You know, I was just talking to a client like an hour ago about this. So my journaling looks different every day, depending on kind of where I'm at in my headspace. Sometimes it's stick figures and sometimes it's just like a single word doodling. Sometimes it's like, well thought out journal entries, like kind of like a traditional journal entry. And I do have a five minute journal, which I absolutely love. So if I'm super short on time, then I'll use that. Yeah, I am on my third or fourth five minute journal and I've been trying to get those guys on the show. So maybe I'll, maybe I'll, <laughs> maybe I'll uh, tag them in this and be like, guys, I'm buying a bunch of your stuff and I'm plugging it. <laughs> do you want to, <laughs> do you want to give me an hour of your time, please? <laughs> uh, no, it's, it's a, I, I love the five minute journal. It's, it's a great, easy way to get started in morning journaling. And uh, I think it also kind of helps you almost focus a little bit like, you know, I always use this analogy where it's like, you know, there's always, you know, your life or your day or whatever is like a picture. There's going to be some parts that are rough. There's going to be some parts that kind of suck a little bit. It's just life. And when you go through the journaling process, especially using the five minute journal, it really allows you to like focus on like the part of the picture or the painting or whatever analogy you want to use. That's, that's going really well for you or that you're really appreciative for. Yeah. Absolutely. It's brought a lot of clarity, like surprise, a surprising amount of clarity for me. <laughs> yeah. It's one exercise, uh, and we can stop talking about the journal after this, but uh, one exercise I've done is I went back to all my five-minute journals, and I went through and I just made like chicken scratches in a notebook, like how many times I said I was grateful for something or what made a day great. And then I was like, okay, so like one of the things was something that always makes my day great is – uh having dinner with like friends, like having like a big group family dinner type thing. Like I just, I love that. So I try to make sure and get those in as much as I can now. And then it was like, what was one thing I could improve today? It was like exercise (laughs) because I skipped or something, you know? (laughs) So it kind of helps you build almost like a manual for how to design your day or week to fit your, uh, your perfect day or life, I guess. So look at it. Yeah. So what um what do you think has been the most impactful book that you've read? Oh my gosh, this is my favorite question ever right now because I just finished this book that has seriously changed my entire life. Uh, so it's this book called A Million Miles in a Thousand Years by Donald Miller, and it is absolutely fantastic. Um, it was recommended to me by a good friend of mine who also understands like my love of, of adventure and seeking out experience. And this book is all about how we live um, a story and what stands out to us most are the memorable moments or the scenes of our story and how to kind of craft and create more of those memorable scenes. And, and not in a way that's like, not in a way that's like creating like a memorable scene to like post on social media and like do something like grandiose, you know, but like just what's going to stand out to you. Like when you are like laying on your deathbed, what are the things you're going to remember? Um, and as Donald Miller kind of goes through this book, he takes us, he kind of walks us through his life where he's living this life and he's totally, he's fine. It's fine but it's nothing that's really standing out to him in his story. So he kind of makes these changes and does these like does different things to create more experiences, memorable scenes. And it is just a beautiful book. I read it on the airplane last week and I was just sobbing on the airplane because it's just so incredibly beautiful. So huge, huge game changer that one. Yeah. I'm a, well, you really sold me on it. So now I'm like, I'm like writing down, like going to have to pull it up on Audible or, or get a copy or something like that. That's cool. It sounds like a, an awesome book. Uh, would you be willing to share any of the things that like you decided were going to be like, uh, what was the term you used? Like your main, your main things or things to make your life. I, I don't know. I'll let, I'll let you take that and answer it however you will. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, you know, I feel like I I do a pretty good job of making sure that I do have a lot of memorable experiences and scenes in my life. But that's because I go out of my way to create that I make sure that I'm always doing something that I find deeply fulfilling, whether that's hiking with my guy and our dogs or taking trips to go ride like 
downhill mountain bikes at Lake Tahoe or whatever it is. And sometimes it's not things like on a grand scale, you know, it could be like hiking up the hill in the backyard and like lighting a fire under the full moon, but constantly seeking out those experiences. So I feel like the book really more reinforced the importance of those things rather than kind of like inspiring me to do more. It just kind of reinforced like the, these are the things that I love so much and that make me so happy in my life and to keep doing them. <laughs> yeah, that's, I think that's great. Great life advice and important life advice is, you know, being able to identify that is really important. And then actually taking the time to do it is, is even, you know, is that's probably the hard. Well, they're both difficult identifying and then making the time. But I think it's important for everyone to do. Is there a uh, is there a message that you'd like to leave the, the audience with today? Um, when you had said this earlier, I was already thinking I was like, what's that going to be? And I think it's take action. Um, I was having a conversation with my mom the other day and she, she had mentioned to me something that she wasn't motivated to do. She, it was something she needs to do. And she's like, oh, I'm just not motivated. And I'm like, actually we can't rely on motivation, right? We have to just take action, see what happens, learn from it and then course correct and take more action. Like that's just kind of the, the way that it's got to go. So if you have no idea what you're doing or where to start, do something anyways, because once you do that thing, it's going to kind of give you some feedback and you'll better, you'll better know like where to go from there. Yeah. I love that answer. It's, um, a lot of, a lot of college students will be like, Hey, how, like, what do I do? Or how do I do that? Or like, what should my major be? Or what should my career be? I'm like, well, have you ever, have you ever had a job? Have you ever done anything? <laughs> I'm like, they're like, well, no, I don't know what to do. I'm like, well, just start trying as many things as you can. So you get like a spectrum of like, I, I really know, I know I really don't want to do that again. I didn't like it and I really enjoyed that. So I'm going to try to do more things like it. And eventually you kind of build like a, uh, I guess like a, you get an understanding of which way you should go. Uh, so that pretty much wraps up our, uh, our interview. So thank you for, for taking the time to show up and chat with me today. Uh, how, how would somebody, uh, follow you or find any of your stuff? Let's say if they wanted to do the dumbbell domination or join uh, girls gone strong. Yeah. Uh, you can find me at my website, which is jencomas.com or, uh, we're over at girls gone strong, which is girls gone strong.com. And then of course, facebook.com backslash girls gone strong. We're always posting about the free Facebook groups, um, over there. So tons of great information. Well, folks, that is a wrap for this week's show. Thank you for tuning in again to this episode of The Formula. Now, if you'd like to find out about any of the stuff that uh, Jen and I talked about, such as her her workout dumbbell domination, uh, or you'd like to check out the Girls Gone Strong Facebook group, or just check out her personal website, I've linked all that into the show notes. So go ahead and uh, you know check that out if it sounds like something that you would find to be beneficial, which I feel like anyone who is exploring more in the world of fitness would definitely find some, uh, just a lot of really good information there. So on another note, if you think you'd enjoy or you would like to receive you know more podcasts, articles, uh, check out our online courses when we release them, go ahead and head over to helixacademy.co. And there's, we got all kinds of new stuff that have, has just come out. I mean, we have our, you know, how to conquer your week free online drip course, which is basically how do you go about optimizing your week to give you the, give you the, like the, the best week you can possibly get, whether that's through a productivity standpoint or doing things that you just enjoy and making sure that you, you set aside time for those things. Uh, we also just had two new online courses drop. We had uh, Drew Curtis's Online Communities Masterclass, and we had Matthew Rhoda's How to Pitch Your Startup to Win course come out as well. So if any of those things sound interesting to you, go ahead and head over to helixacademy.co and you know check them out or drop me a line if you have any questions, trevor at helixacademy.co. That's a wrap for this week's show. Thank you for tuning in. Uh, I'm Trevor Carlson. I look forward to you tuning in next week. This episode of The Formula was produced by Helix Academy, and the music was provided by the artist known as Moods. Make sure and check him out on Facebook or Spotify. That's M-O-O-D-S.